So let's say that I need a chair. I, in the ancient times, would contact a person who would make me a chair. And then he would say, um, what do you have that I want? And I would say, well, I have chickens, so would you like some eggs? And they would say, um, no, I don't need any eggs, I need nails. And so then I would go, oh man, how am I supposed to do that? So I would go to the blacksmith and say, hey, would you like some eggs? And I could trade you for some nails. And they would say, no, I don't need uh, any eggs, I need some iron. And so then I'd go to the miner and I would say, hey, do you have some iron? And he would say, yeah. And so I would give him the eggs and then I would get the rocks to give to the blacksmith to make the nails to give to the guy for the chair. So much work, right? Bartering um, could get very complicated. And we would have to take an egg, and in order to get a chair with some eggs, I would have to get some rocks and some iron, and then the chair. So when we look at the history of how we simplify this, it gets complicated and sometimes um, a little unclear. Interestingly, plant seeds are extremely uniform, and agriculture produced a lot of them. So here you guys can see a bunch of grains of rice, and they are crazy similar in size, extremely uniform. This is a piece of dried corn that you can take the individual kernels out of and then replant, and each of those pieces of uh, kernels of corn will grow into a new corn plant. If you were to go buy them, right, the seeds look like this, again, surprisingly uniform. Sunflower seeds, very uniform. Squash seeds, you guessed it, uniform. Pea seeds, yeah, all those little peas, if you dry them out, you can plant them, very uniform. If you like green beans, inside of them are little seeds, also very uniform. Tomatoes all grow based on the little seeds that are inside, very uniform. And then even if we look at a flower like echinacea, the seeds are all extremely uniform. So all of these, depending on which culture and which society, could have been used for counting and trading in goods. So what would happen is that they would use these as measurement, right? And the Romans decided that a pound were going to be 1,728 grains, um, typically of carob seeds. And so then you could trade bags of grain for goods, like a pound of grain maybe would uh, be equivalent to what you could get for like two horseshoes. Um, and so it might be 10 pounds of grain or something for two horseshoes. Um, then along comes these ideas of tokens. And so tokens were issued for goods like um, in exchange for grains or for food sources in Egypt and in Babylon, India and China, these tokens came along so that you could use tokens to get what you needed. So I don't have a lot of them hanging around, but tokens that we still use today are things like um, poker chips, or this is a token for um, a hotel in Las Vegas that you can use, where there are things that like represent money, but aren't actually money, or represent a good or a service that we can use. So in other cultures, they had different types of things they would use for money. Um, cowrie shells were actually very popular for a long time. They're very hard and very uniform, and you could put them on a string that made them easy to carry that could be exchanged for um, sources of money. And they were actually still used into the 1900s in some parts of the world. So here we have some seashells, and you can see these are cowrie shells um, that I was talking about. And a lot of them have these holes on the back, and so it makes it so that you can string them up um, and carry them around, um, which is why some cultures have like those necklaces that are made out of these. Um, this, you can see, are a different type of shells that also naturally have occurring holes. And so you could string these up and then carry them around and use them for money as well. They're super hard, they're super durable, and so they were a really good choice for money in the early times. So along comes the Chinese, the great innovators, who decided to take their metal that they were able to cast and turn it into money, to coins. They used scrap metals and put a hole in the center so they could carry it just like the shells. Here's a really cool random coin I just happen to have. It's from 1918 from France, and you can see it has a hole in the middle, much like the ancient Chinese um, coins would have in order to be able to carry it more easily. 
Then in Turkey and Greece, uh, about 500 years later, they started making money out of precious metals like gold, silver, and bronze and stamped heads and faces and important things into it. So I'm certainly not a great coin collector, but we can see here that like in the United States, we have dollar coins. We have 50 cents, 25 cents, 10 cents, 5 cents, 1 cent. Other countries in the world have similar, like uh, Canada, if you live close to Canada, you know that the pennies and the dimes and the quarters sometimes get kind of confusing, can bog up vending machines. Um, in Mexico, they have pennies. They have other things too. This is just kind of what I had laying around the house. They have 20 cent instead of 25 cent coins. And then they have something interesting we don't have, which is a $2 coin. And it's made with um, two different types of metals in it, which is pretty cool. Um, the Dominican Republic, though, they have a 25 peso coin. The euro is very interesting. Many countries in Europe, they have 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50. They do have a $1 coin, and I don't have one. I spent it when I was there. And then they have a 2 euro coin, much like Mexico. The Swiss also have 2, 1, 10, and then other smaller denominations. And this one I think is super interesting. This is from um, Iceland and it's actually kind of old. Um, it's from the 40s. And so it's a teeny, teeny, tiny little 25 cent. It's like the size, it's like smaller than our penny. Um, so every country kind of has their own way. See how little it is? Their own way of breaking up their denominations. But these metal coins are pretty popular worldwide. So now if I wanted a chair and I went to a guy who made chairs and I got eggs, I'd be like, hey, you want some eggs? And he'd be like, nope, don't not have any interest in your eggs. But I can find anybody else who wants eggs. And as long as they have some money, they can give me some money for the eggs. And then I can trade with them an amount that I think is fair for my time and energy. And then I can take that money that I make from selling my eggs and give it to the person who made my chair. And so everyone is able to make and get what they want when they need it. So then the question is, why were metals the earliest form of, you know, materials that were good for 